Hello, I'm really happy to welcome you to today's session, Liberating Life, Women's Freedom. I'm Alina and I will do the moderation this evening. Um, it's another seminar. Um, it's another seminar in the webinar series of Urgelan's Paradigm from Women Waving Future. And the series is about the paradigm of Abdullah Öcalan, who has now been in prison for over 20 years. Um, nevertheless, he's giving a revolutionary perspective for today's struggles all over the world. And the series, we talked about different political issues with the paradigm of Abdullah Öcalan. In today's session, called Liberating Life, Women's Freedom, we invited Dilla Derek. Um, to talk about the theory and practice of the Kurdish women's liberation movement through its struggle against feminist rights. Uh, it will be about the current campaigns and uh, initiatives in the context of colonization and political violence. It will point out how this is connected to the long-term effort for a society free from patriarchy. Dilla Derrick holds a PhD in soci sociology from University of Cambridge, and she's cu currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford and author of the forthcoming book, The Kurdish Women's Movement, History, Theory and Practice. So again, I welcome all of you and I am happy um, to have uh, Dilla here. And actually I will give uh, the word to you for your input and for all of you, you are uh, really warmly invited to um, write your questions um, to the chat and uh, we will collect them and later Dilla can answer them after the input. So welcome again. Thank you so much Marlene for the introduction and thanks everybody for, for listening in. I will share my screen for the presentation. Yes, and um, so I will jump straight in. Uh, of course, many of you will know that there are several other uh, videos on the Women Weaving Future uh, YouTube channel about the, the history and politics of the Kurdish women's movement. And so I will try not to repeat anything that has already been said. Instead, I will speak about uh, ways of tackling feminicide, which of course many of you know is one of the Uh, urgent global issues today and I will try to give a sense of the ways in which um, the women's movement uh, connects different systems of violence from the household to world politics uh, from intimate partner violence to um, global uh, militarism on a, on a global scale. So I will also uh, speak about the term uh, political feminicide uh, as a distinct form of targeting women who resist patriarchal systems and structures such as fascism, capitalism, ecocide, colonialism, uh, racism, and so on, and the state as well. So let us first um, try to briefly understand uh, what is feminicide. Um, the word feminicide, or sorry, femicide was first uh, coined by feminist thinker and activist Diana Russell in the 1970s. And Russell was among the women who among the people who organized the first uh, international tribunal on uh, crimes against women. And years later, she defined femicide as the killing of females by males because they are female, with the aim of shedding also light on the specifically gendered nature of certain forms of homicide and how they are linked to wider systems of power and domination in society. And of course, much has been done since the 1970s, 1970s to, to tackle violence against women, including feminicide. And um, we will get into a bit more detail, but before that, I want to point out that um, feminist activists and scholars sometimes use these words femicide or feminicide uh, interchangeably. So both terms are valid and both are used, but the literature of the Kurdish women's movement tends to prefer uh, feminicide. And this is because it draws also on the legacy of Central American and um, Latin American feminists who coined the, coined the term feminicidio to discuss also the role of the state in the perpetuation of the phenomenon. But translations vary. And so please, when I show photos later on, don't be confused if you see one or the other. Uh, as I mentioned, 
Um, Latin American feminists um, and scholars often point to the critical role of the state played in the making of climates and cultures that socially normalize the killing of women. In different parts of the world, feminists have linked uh, feminicide also to colonization, to racism and other forms of domination in society. Uh, among others, um, the work of uh, that I personally value is the work of uh, Nadira Shalhub Kovorkian, who works on Palestine, and she offers a broadened uh, definition of feminicide beyond the simple monitoring of, of individual cases. She says that femicide can be seen as the process leading to death and the creation of a situation in which it is possible for the victim to it is impossible for the victim to live. That is, femicide is all of the hegemonic masculine social methods used to destroy females' rights, ability, potential, and power to live safely. It is a form of abuse, threat, invasion, and assault that degrades and subordinates women. It leads to continuous fear, frustration, isolation, exclusion, and harm to females' ability to control their personal intimate lives. So I think this is a very nice uh, definition which captures many of the things that other people are also discussing. And I think it also fits well with some of the themes that I want to discuss today. And in her work, um, Nadira Shalhub Kevorkian also argues that in context of colonization and political violence, the violence experienced by women, including feminicide, cannot be understood in a vacuum. We have to understand these things together, especially in context of war and conflict. Um, so, of course, there is a long history of feminist scholarship and activism uh, that linked colonialism, capitalism, imperialism, racism, uh, ecocide and other things to feminicide and other forms of gendered violence. And today there's also we have to acknowledge that there's also an increasing agenda around women, peace and security. And unfortunately, unlike previous feminist uh, anti-system efforts to tackle violence against women, uh, these securitized discourses often rely on states or even on uh, capitalist or militarist institutions such as uh, NATO or the World Bank or the IMF for the protection of women. So people who are uh, serious about uh, ending violence against women and who know uh, how to make links between systems of oppression uh, usually see the irony of this. But uh, I think many of us who are critical of mainstream understandings of governments or NGOs also point out that um, one cannot speak about violence against women and not consider the role of the state of capitalism, the military industrial complex and so on. So let's now talk about um, the, how the Kurdish women's liberation movement assesses the phenomenon of feminicide, uh, namely as a long-term, as a product of a long-term history of patriarchal power and one that is intimately tied to the state system. So before we get into that, I just want to uh, have us take a look at what happened in the last uh, two to three years. And let's start with the most uh, recent developments. Um, So in June to 2021, so just less than two months ago, uh, two weeks before Turkey actually withdrew from the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention, a young woman named Deniz Poyraz was murdered in the Izmir headquarters of the People's Democratic Party, the HDP. And very early on, reports suggested that uh, Deniz Poyraz, who is a politically active woman herself, uh, was not really the main target of this uh, far-right Turkish nationalist attack. It was um, done by somebody who had planned a large-scale massacre in this party building, and she was working there, uh, replacing her mother, who was sick uh, for, from work. So she was not the main target. She just happened to be there because the person who committed the massacre assumed that the building would be uh, more full. Yet the HDP and women's rights activists and the wider Kurdish women's movement and the women's the, the Kurdish freedom movement in general immediately referred to this as feminicide. So in that moment, statements, articles, social media posts, um, protests, speeches, and so on in the aftermath of the killing um, immediately framed this, this thing as uh, feminicide, including um, her family also pointed to the gendered nature of this killing. So this is very interesting, I think, and this is a very recent case. And um, it's important to ask, what is this uh, reaction? How come there is this kind of reaction to this massacre? Why did people frame this uh, essentially ultra-nationalist attack on a political party as feminicide? 
And I think to get this, we need to look at um, the wider political uh, context because uh, the murderer who is here in this picture, Onur Gencer, had recently spent time in Turkish occupied parts of majority Kurdish regions in, in northern Syria. This is an Instagram post of his. And uh, he tagged uh, himself as being in Syria, in Membij specifically. And he poses with an assault rifle here. And he has other photos where he poses with ultra-nationalist symbols behind Turkish flags and so on. So, of course, many of you will know that uh, Rojava uh, is a site in which the um, ideas of Abdullah Öcalan have been implemented since 2012. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with his ideas because they have been discussed as part of the seminar, webinar series and with its political, cultural, and um, social efforts towards women's liberation, Rojava also became a historical turning point in the women's struggle in the, in the region, in, the, in Kurdistan, as well as in the Middle East region more broadly. And the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, which was built as an outcome of the Rojava revolution, uh, claims that women's liberation is, is part of its, it's a main pillar of its political system. So in 2018, um, of course, most prominently, people came to hear about this region also because of the fight against the so-called Islamic State. But there's a much broader, um, what's the women's movement there called a women's liberation uh, revolution, basically a women's revolution. So in 2018, the Turkish state launched Operation Olive Branch uh, on Afrin, which is uh, uh, in, in this, uh, this region. And in 2019, Operation Peace Spring in, in another area uh, between Tel Abyad and Ras Al Ain, or Giresbi and Serekani in Kurdish, uh, in northern Syria. And the mercenary militias that um, were trained, funded, and commanded by the Turkish army, they documented, um, they committed documented war crimes and abuses, including the systematic torturing, kid kidnapping, and killing of, of women. So among the practice practices that they did were the deliberate uh, circulation of footage of uh, mutilated um, and, and stripped dead bodies of Kurdish women fighters. So that was one very big episode. These two Turkish invasions on northern Syria uh, were very crucial in this regard. So this is where the person who committed Deniz Poyra's murder, he is current. He, he claims to have st uh, spent some time in this Turkish occupied region. And um, another thing to mention is that prior to these military operations uh, in 2015, the peace process between the Turkish state and the PKK had collapsed. So thousands of women, including prominent uh, rights defenders, MPs and mayors, were subsequently imprisoned by the state for terrorism. And on many occasions, because of all of these things combined, as, and also other things that I cannot get into in detail at the moment, uh, the Turkish state has repeatedly been accused of coordinating with the so-called Islamic State against the Kurdish struggle for autonomy in northern Syria. So in this context, the Kurdish women's liberation movement has increasingly uh, started to accuse the Turkish state also of leading a comprehensive, not just genocidal, but also feminicidal war. Um, so in the 2010s, uh, to just go back a bit more for context, the so-called Islamic State or Daesh, um, as a group that explicitly used sexual violence in, in war, in governance, in propaganda, uh, came really to represent the naked face of, of patriarchy. And of course, those years saw a general surge in uh, violence against women, gendered and sexualized violence in the context of regional wars and episodes of large-scale displacement, um, especially in Syria and in Iraq. Um, and all kinds of crimes against women were committed by a variety of actors. And um, of course, many of you will be familiar with the fact that um, in August 2014, Daesh massacred thousands of Yazidi men in the uh, region of Shengal or Sinjar and kidnapped and also killed and uh, in quotation marks enslaved thousands of women and children. So the Kurdish women's liberation movement, which also includes several autonomous Yazidi women's assemblies, consistently referred to the genocide by ISIS also as a feminicide interestingly because the majority of the dead were men uh, but still this was framed as a feminicide because it is and another thing that i would like to point out before we get into the definitions of feminicide um, in order to make sense of how the movement uh, understands feminicide another thing is important to consider and that is basically the three triple murders that happened in the in the past years so um as you can see in the first uh 
slots in Paris 2013, Sakina Jansis, who was one of the co-founders of the PKK, the woman in the middle in the first picture, as well as Fidan Doan and Leila Shailemez were uh, murdered in Paris uh, by uh, somebody with links to the Turkish intelligence uh, right before the beginning of the uh, short-lived peace process between the PKK and the Turkish state. Um, in the second picture, you see, um, sorry, it should be 2016, not uh, 15. Uh, Seve Demir, Fatma Uyar, and Pakize Nair, uh, who were killed in northern Kurdistan or in Turkey in 2016. Uh, they were a group of civilians who were killed by the Turkish army in the aftermath of the collapse of the peace process during the urban war that erupted between the warring parties. And lastly, you see uh, Zehra Berkel, Hebun Melekhalil, and Emine Weisi, who were killed uh, last summer in 2020 in uh, in Rojava, in Kobani. And many of you will know the name Kobani because that was the place where people first heard about Kurdish women fighters during the epic battle against the so-called Islamic State. So these women were killed in a cross-border drone strike that was conducted by the Turkish state uh, on a women's gathering in a civilian house uh, in, in Kobani last year. So, um, if you listen to to other photos uh, to other videos on this channel you will know that um drawing on the work of uh, abdullah öcalan the kurdish women's liberation movement uh, analyzes patriarchy as a 5000 year old system related to the state and within this trajectory a 500 year old um, capitalist modernity a system of nation state exploitation colonialism positivism ecocide and patriarchy and it's important to point out that the geography that overlaps with Upper Mesopotamia were roughly what we would call um, a part of the Middle East today and Kurdistan is within that, is understood in the movement's ideology and its political writing uh, as having a long durée history of feminicide. So in, the, in this one, in like a 5,000 year old history of feminicide can be traced in that sense. And in the one century old history of the nation state in the region, uh, various genocides and massacres were of course committed by different actors against ethnic and religious groups. So the Armenian genocide, for example, the SAFO, which is um, a series of Ottoman era genocides on Syriacs, Assyrians and Chaldeans, uh, massacres on Kurds, for example, in the 1930s, uh, the massacre in Dersim, which was uh, targeting Alevi Kurds um, by the Turkish uh, early Turkish Republic, or the Al Amfa campaign, which was basically um, the genocide campaign under the Iraqi regime of Saddam Hussein against the, the Kurds, as well as numerous genocides in the history of the Yazidis. These can all be analyzed also in through the lens of feminicide. People tend to just call them genocide, but they are also feminicides. So the literature of the Kurdish women's movement always also tries to draw attention to this. And um, it's also interesting to see that the publications of the wider Kurdish freedom movement, not just the women's movement, often uh, refers to the term World War III to describe um, what is currently happening in the world, which it also frames as a form of society side. So not just genocide, but also society is being killed under what Öcalan calls uh, capitalist modernity. So large scale state violence, um, fascism, nationalism, religious fundamentalism, positivism, ecological catastrophe are all linked to uh, each other and patriarchy, of course. And within this dynamic, uh, within this World War III, which encompasses society side, the movement also locates a war on women. So uh, something that presents the basis also for other forms of oppression and domination and violence in society. So what the movement calls war on women is understood as having also a broader destructive effect on uh, society as a whole. So um, the movement's framing of feminicide in this sense attempts to connect the violence that is experienced in the so-called private sphere uh, to larger systems of power, such as the international uh, nation state system. And this also is done by calling at the same time for a worldwide autonomous women's democratic confederal system as a form of self-defense against feminicide. I will come to that, uh, come back to that a little later. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about recent campaigns and actions that the movement has been engaged in to, to, to tackle femicide. 
So in 2020, last year, in response to um, these developments that I've just mentioned, the Turkish occupations, the collapse of the peace process, um, the imprisonment, mass imprisonment of uh, women's rights defenders and politicians and writers, and uh, the genocides, femicides committed by groups like ISIS. So in response to these things that happened in the past decade, but also specifically in the last two, three years, uh, the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement launched, among other things, the 100 Reasons campaign. Uh, the full name is 100 Reasons to Prosecute the Dictator, who's uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The aim of this campaign was to, it is an ongoing one, is to uh, document the stories of women who were killed either uh, directly or indirectly by the policies of the Turkish state. Um, and 100 stories were uh, selected for this campaign and showcased as representations of a widespread phenomenon. So this, the main dossier, for example, of this campaign uh, describes violence experienced by women, including feminicide as, and I quote, as part of a systematic destruction of women's identity, free thoughts, will, creativity, and self-determination. So uh, this campaign is led by the Kurdish women's movement in, in Europe, and its materials reflect really the wider language and vocabulary of the movement, uh, its perspective and its goals. So the dossier, for example, traces the roots of the words femicide, feminicide, and makes reference to uh, Latin American feminists uh, and activists elaboration on the role of the state in the systematic uh, killing of women. It specifically draws on Maria Marcela Lagarde's definition, um, and it says that, I read, uh, as the Kurdish women's movement, we speak of femicide as a comprehensive, structurally anchored war against women, both in armed conflicts and in everyday life. This war takes place on a physical, military level, as well as on an ideological and psychological level. So as you can see, uh, there's an explicit uh, refusal to kind of accept this private public dichotomy and to actually make the effort of linking these things together. And femicide is also feminicide or femicide is also characterized as a system of, of governance, a way of governing society. And that is entangled with other forms of power and control. For example, the text further reads, um, I quote, from the beginning until today, the creation, implementation and maintenance of the patriarchal system of rule has been based on feminicide. Even the deepening of this relationship of oppression through colonialism, imperialism, capitalism and nationalism always used feminicide as one of its most powerful instruments. So this campaign also echoes other publications of the movement, which claim that in the person of women, uh, the, the fabric of society in general gets targeted. So. Um, this, in that sense, links feminicide also to genocide and also to what I mentioned earlier as society side. So uh, the campaign really explicitly talks about how it's not just the biological bodies uh, of, of uh, people who are read as women, but also uh, I read here, women are not only attacked as biological bodies, but as potential representatives of a society based on cooperation and care justice and peace, community and sustainability, love and diversity. So um, the, what is, what is uh, said here is that explicitly um, attacks on women, specifically on organized women, are also an attempt to undermine the effort of building a different society with new transformed, more egalitarian social relations. One interesting thing to point out, I think also from now, is that many of the written materials produced by the movement, its campaigns, its statements, its protest speeches and so on, um, they tend to only marginally refer to statistics and government produced data, for example, is widely seen as unreliable, politicized and incomplete and so on. Uh, to talk about another kind of effort is, for example, the Middle East-based uh, Kurdish Women's Relations Office, REPAC, um, also recently published a dossier in just last year. It's titled uh, The AKP, the Justice and Development Party's War on Women, and it offers a detailed account of the historical evolution of the conservative, um, increasingly more authoritarian and Islamist uh, government of the Turkish state. Um, and it calls it um, these policies explicitly patriarchal feminicidal policies. Uh, the report cites data to connect economic, social and cultural discrimination and violence against women in the government's domestic policies to its uh, wider 
militaristic and expansionist policies in the region. As we can see, the Turkish state has recently launched wars in several countries and has been sending mercenaries to different countries, such as Armenia or um, Libya. And the dossier also focuses on the complicity of Western institutions, such as uh, NATO and the EU, in the empowerment of this feminicidal system. And this, I think, also resonates with um, a common claim made by activists who criticize that the violence committed by different groups in the context of war and conflict, for example, is sometimes condemned, of course, in human rights reports, but these are often taken out of context. The context, the political context is not sufficiently given. For example, the fact that many extremist groups in Syria were trained, uh, funded and armed by countries like Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar with the support of the US and European governments, uh, that this is very rarely pronounced, but it's very important for us to understand the relationship between different forms of violence uh, in this context. Now I want to move to the term political feminicide. Um, it is specifically defined in a brochure by Congre Astar, which is the umbrella grassroots women's movement in Rojava. And uh, together with Women Defend Rojava, which is an international campaign, uh, the Congre Astar has been writing several brochures and you can also check some of these uh, online if you go on the Women Defend Rojava website. Um, so in response, especially to the recent Turkish invasions, uh, the, the movement has come up with the term political feminicide to also uh, point out the specific nature of the targeting of politically active women um, by states and paramilitary forces and so on. So in this first brochure that you can see here, it defines political feminicide as follows. Um, the selective killing of women who organize and take an active role in, the defending, in defending freedom is a widespread and systematic practice throughout the world and throughout history. Hundreds of thousands of women have been murdered for their political thought and practice. And on many of these occasions, these crimes have been orchestrated by states and perpetrated by state military or police forces or by paramilitary groups, mercenaries or hitmen. So this text is very interesting because it also refers, among others, to people like uh, Rosa Luxemburg, to Mariela Franco, a Brazilian activist, uh, Berta Cáceres, uh, who was murdered in Honduras, uh, the sisters Mirabal from the Dominican Republic or Mina Kashwar Kamal from Afghanistan, a leading member of or founding member of the Revolutionary Association of uh, Women of Afghanistan. Uh, all of these are mentioned as examples of resisting women who were deliberately targeted by states or pol paramilitary political agendas. Um, and of course, in light of the recent developments, this term political feminicide, and I will give a few more examples, and I have already given the triple murders at the beginning as an example. Uh, in light of what has happened in the region recently, this term has become used more commonly in the movement. Um, I want to mention also in January of this year, uh, Saada Al Harmas, the co chair of the Til El Shair Municipality Civil Council, and her deputy Hind Al Khadr were abducted, tortured, and murdered in the majority Arab region of Shadadi, uh, which is part of the autonomous administration of North and East Syria. Um, and these assassinations were um, claimed by Daesh. So you can see the photo in the third picture here. This is a protest condemning their killing. And Congress Dar, uh, in several publications and in the protests and in TV programs and so on, characterize these murders also as an attack to undermine the civilian struggle of women and also women's solidarity, uh, because it was here also Arab women who were targeted. So Congre Astar and other organizations framed this as an attack to make sure that women together across communities um, are prevented from, from, from building a more free uh, society free from patriarchy. So in several brochures and dossiers, also the Kurdish women's movement claims that the Turkish state commits feminicide, uh, either with its mercenaries or directly, against uh, organized women as part of its occupation uh, project. And in the middle, you see a brochure on the killing of the three women in, in Kobani. But also, um, for example, following Turkey's um, Operation Peace Spring in October 2019, women's organizations launched a campaign uh, with the name um, Occupation is Violence, as you can see here. Um, and the campaign connects also war and occupation to the rise of violence against women, including child marriage and uh, domestic abuse, feminicide, and so on. 
And in that year, in 2019, just a few a month or so later, after the occupation started, a Kurdish, Arab, um, Assyrian, Syriac, Chechen and Turkmen women organized mass demonstrations in various cities uh, on the occasion of 25th November International Day Against Violence Against Women with that slogan, "Women, uh, sorry, Occupation is Violence. You can see the logo here and it shows um, the sisters Mirabal who were executed uh, during the Trujillo dictatorship in the Dominican Republic and the International Day Against Violence Against Women 25th November is um, dedicated to their memory. So you can see those women, as well as women that were recently killed in the in one of the Turkish uh, occupations. So this is very interesting symbolism as well, because I will speak at the end more about how uh, the struggle against feminicide is also an occasion for transnational feminist um, um, struggle as well. Um, one thing that uh, happened very early on in the so-called Peace Spring operation in 2019, was the killing of Hevrin Khalaf, um, who was a spokeswoman of the Syrian Future Party, and she was brutally executed by members of Ahral al sharqiyah one of the Islamist proxy forces allied with the Turkish state. And in this other photo that you can see here, these people were circulating also images of, of themselves uh, mutilating the bodies of, of women fighters. And this is a continuation of something that had happened in 2018 in Afrin, which is still under occupation. So um, interestingly, um, the day after the killing of Denis Poiras, whom I mentioned at the beginning uh, in Turkey, Congress there held protests across northern Syria, so just in the last couple of weeks, um, and it explicitly likened the attack of, to, of Denis Poydas to the killing of Hevrin Khalaf. So both were framed as feminicide genocide committed by the Turkish state and its allies in the region. And among the people who launched protests for Denis Poyras were also women in Shahba, which is a region where the residents of Afrin had to flee to after their homes were occupied. So they also linked their occupied situation to the killing of Denis Poyras and, um, and other policies of the Turkish state in the region. So it's really interesting to see this transnational character through it, in which the movement understands this feminist side genocide of the Turkish state. Um, so when um, reading the movement's work on feminicide, uh, it's also interesting to see that um, often, just to get rid of this photo for a bit, um, that often words like uh, prevention or protection are actually missing, especially uh, calls for protection or prevention from state bodies or formal institutions. Instead, the vocabulary that the movement uses invokes ideas around um, self-determined autonomous forms of organized struggle to, to abolish patriarchy. And this is reflected in many of the brochures and works of the movement in, in recent years. For example, Congress Star and Women Defend Rojava also have a, a brochure called um, Self-Defense, the Answer to Gender-Based Violence, which you can also download on their website. And it references also um, things that happened in Nazi Germany, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Armenia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and so on. And also in the context of indigenous communities and colonization of different parts of the world. So um, I think this is also very interesting to see these international connections that the movement makes. Um, also, I want to mention that in 2019, on the fifth anniversary of the Daesh massacre on the Yazidis, the Kurdish women's movement, and this was especially an effort led by Yazidi autonomous assemblies, uh, declared that the 3rd of August, which is the day Daesh committed the genocide feminicide, should be International Day Against Feminicide. And in many protests and assembly meetings, statements, uh, Yazidi women constantly emphasize the need for autonomous women's self-organization to end further episodes of violence. So, of course, on one hand, many NGOs and governments have been doing work on behalf of the Yazidis after the genocide. But it's also important to remember um, that it was the guerrillas of the Kurdistan Workers' Party and fighters from Rojava who were the first ones to basically take care of the survivors and prevent the further unfolding of the genocide. And several women's autonomous assemblies have been formed ever since. And these have been making such calls to basically uh, establish a, a more autonomous system, a self-determined democracy for this community as a way of preventing further femicide. And this is really interesting, I think. 
Um, the campaigns and protests of the Kurdish women's liberation movement, I should also say that, um, are very widely shown in news agencies, in TV programs, in newspapers of the Kurdish freedom movement. And I think this is very important because it's uh, related to raising awareness, of course. Um, videos of protests are usually broadcasted uh, through affiliated TV channels and social media accounts in um, several languages. And some of you might be familiar with uh, the old women's Jin TV, which you can also find on YouTube. Um, but there are also other channels and newspapers that speak about feminicide and how it's linked to these other forms of um, violence. But it's not just to say that violence is a product of colonization, but violence is seen as a product of a 5,000 year old history of patriarchy and states and other forms of violence in the region. And that it has to start with a fight happening inside our own communities, in our families, and also inside our own minds. Um, Interestingly, guerrillas, uh, including men, also frequently use the term feminicide when assessing the political situation in Kurdistan or the wider Middle East region. And um, for example, the KJK, which is the guerrilla-led umbrella organization to build democratic confederalism in the Middle East and beyond, um, it's based in the mountains. In 2019, when the Yazidi Women's Assembly is called to make the 3rd of August International Day Against Feminicide, this was also supported by the by the guerrillas. And it's interesting because these regular endorsements of these campaigns and these open supports by the guerrillas for these campaigns against feminicide also contribute to the mainstreaming of the women's um, struggle to the wider liberation cause to decolonize Kurdistan. Um, anyone who has attended a protest organized with the Kurdish movement will know that uh, speakers from the women's movement are often given prioritized uh, speaking slots. And this also creates an atmosphere in which the fight against feminicide, against violence against women is always made present in the minds of people who attend protests for seemingly unrelated uh, kind of causes or things that are not directly related to the women's struggle or violence against women. Um, so if you look at protest videos or if you attend the protests organized by the movement in Europe or in other places, you often see that um, several issues are we've uh, are woven together into a broad anti-colonial cause so for example calls to um end the imprisonment and isolation of abdullah Öcalan or the turkish occup occupations and invasions in different parts on kurdistan um attacks on the hdp um the arrest of women politicians feminicides and so on they're often protested alongside each other as expressions of um of a war slash occupation concept of the Turkish state uh, against these communities and their radical democracy projects. And um, the women's movement uh, speakers often also connect um, occupation and war to, to feminicide. So it's, a, it's a something, there's an interesting interplay that, uh, that happens in these occasions. And um, another thing that I find very striking uh, when we look at the last couple of years is that there's an increasing um, tendency also in protests of the movement, uh, regardless of what the topic is, um, to mix images of women who were specifically targeted by states or by armed groups for political reasons uh, on one hand, um, and then on the other hand, women who were murdered by their families and partners and strangers for seemingly unpolitical reasons. So this also, of course, is a way of cha challenging this imposed dichotomy between the private and the public. And um, in the traditionally in the vocabulary of the Kurdish uh, movement, when you say martyrs of the women's struggle, what this meant was usually guerrillas and politicians, activists who died over the course of their conscious participation in the liberation struggle. However, in the last years, especially because of the large scale participation of, of civilian women in the struggle, for example, in the context of Rojava's mobilization, and also because of the state's indiscriminate killing of, uh, of civilians, this term, martyrs of the women's struggle, has been expanded a lot. And political discourse does often connect the targeting of publicly active women to the killing of women in the name of so-called honor. And uh, this also challenges men, of course, who praise women's participation in the national struggle. So there are many Kurdish men who are proud of the women who fight uh, for Kurdistan, but they themselves are, of course, perpetuating or normalizing violence against women. So with these campaigns, the Kurdish women's movement is also saying 
the violence experienced by um, a colonizer or an occupier is not necessarily that different from the violence that we experience in our homes by our families. So it's a very um, interesting thing that happens on that uh, front. And for example, what you can see often is that the assassinations and executions of um, political women, we can say like Rosa Luxemburg, the sisters Mirabal, or uh, Kurdish women like Sakina Jansus, for example, are often in the same statements that also condemn uh, feminicides uh, against women without apparent political reasons. So just to give an example, um, last month, uh, just shortly after Denis Poiras was murdered in Turkey, um, there were two feminicides that happened in Rojava and they mobilized really the women's movement in, in that region. Uh, Ada Alcedo was uh, murdered by her family for attempting to run away with her boyfriends and um, Aya Khalaf was strangled to death by her father after her cousin raped her and both of these women were uh, minors they were where they were not adults yet they were minors and um, this is a photo from a protest um, because they both happened in the same week as well I think so Congress Star and other organizations immediately rallied in different towns and cities across the region and one statement, I think it was the one read out in this protest, um, it said something, uh, it said the following, the mentality that murdered Aya and Ada is the same one that murdered Hevrin and Denis, and that rapes and abuses women in the occupied areas. So as you can see, they are linking the assassination of women like uh, Hevrin Khalaf, the targeting by ultranationalists um, like, uh, like what happened to Denis Poiras, to the occupation of, in, of places like Afrin and elsewhere, to these honor, so-called honor killings. So this is really interesting and it shows the kind of approach that the movement takes, I think, to the question of feminicide. And while the state is the main target of these campaign, uh, of these campaigns, it's the, the movement also hits at these other mentalities, these general patriarchal mentalities that, uh, that um, patriarchal partners, um, have in common with colonizers and, and groups like ISIS and so on. So this also, of course, um, is a way of centering the women's struggle in the wider freedom struggle. I will come to an end soon, uh, but I also want to say that in the materials that um, are produced, the movement also often uh, says that it's important for people to move beyond solidarity and to create new forms of women's internationalism from below. And it's saying that by proposing world women's democratic confederalism as a way of uh, autonomous self-organization and self-defense, not just against feminicide, but also for a different society in which patriarchy itself will be abolished. And since feminicide is of course not limited to one geography, uh, it also the struggle against it also presents an occasion to uh, build common struggle um, in a feminist or women's struggle fashion. So in the Middle East, uh, the movement's works on feminicide um, usually takes place uh, within communities, but also it creates platforms with non uh, Kurdish communities um, and, you know, as a larger effort to democratize the region and to uh, build new alliances for more uh, open uh, egalitarian societies, but also beyond the region. So outside of the Middle East region, also the movement and its works on feminicide also are able to enter international feminist uh, debates and spaces. So, for example, uh, in recent years, it was also able to discuss its proposals for world women's democratic confederalism as a grassroots democracy for the global women's uh, struggle and as a new form of internationalism because of its campaigns against feminicide. So in the period that I described, um, several activities also ran parallel to the feminicide specific activities. For example, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Turkish state issued an amnesty for prisoners to help uh, prevent the spread of the virus. And among the inmates of the uh, that were released during the amnesty were perpetrators of violence against women and some of them committed feminicides after they were released and political prisoners however including many women uh, prisoners including women's rights defenders and so on they were excluded from the amnesty 
Uh, there's some other talks on this channel if you want to check them out. So in this context, the women's movement launched the Solidarity Keeps Us Alive campaign for women political prisoners. And this was a campaign that was launched with activists and groups in places like Tunisia, Philippines, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Palestine, Egypt, Morocco, Colombia, and so on. And this campaign, why I'm mentioning it, it's because it's it was focusing on prisons, but it also connected the imprisonment of women's activists to the issue of feminicide, which, of course, as we know, aggravated during the pandemic. So uh, many other issues that the movement is working on is connected to other issues like feminicide. And um, lastly, also to mark the so here are just some examples of, of what I described. The top right is, for example, I think it happened only last week in response to these two feminicides that I mentioned on Aide and Aye. Uh, this was a workshop that was held with members of, of, the, of the political community in the region on feminicide. And as you can see, there's also a lot of engagement for, for men. Uh, but the, the bottom picture here also just was it was an event i'm just giving it as an example of many other events that have been happening it was uh, to mark the first anniversary of the triple feminicide in kobani uh, it's the weaving for life platform stop feminicide campaign and it was launched in june 2021 in an uh, in an online conference and it was signed by nearly this campaign was signed by nearly 300 individuals and organizations most of them in latin america and also the previously mentioned 100 Reasons campaign um, collected within a few months between International Day Against Violence Against Women and 8th March, so between November and March of this year, it collected 20, sorry, 200,000 signatures to prosecute Erdogan for feminicide. And this exceeded the aim of 100,000. So the first stages of that campaign, of the 100 Reasons campaign, consisted of circulating information and gathering signatures, but the next phases will be to prepare the ground for international um, justice initiatives, feminist justice initiatives to demand accountability for feminicides and to uh, basically get feminicide also recognized as a war crime in international law. So these are just some of the ways in which the movement has been able to um, take the occasion of the struggle against feminicide as a way of making alliances and to go beyond solidarity by building forms of struggling together against feminicide. And just to conclude, um, the movement, um, as you can see in this picture as well, is leading basically a multi-front struggle against feminicide. It's on one hand, it's consciousness raising and organization inside one's own community through autonomous women's self-organization. Then there is knowledge production. There is the creation of new theories on feminicide, but also transnational action. So it also recognizes that um, one cannot stop these feminicidal attacks by states or other actors in Kurdistan without the help of international um, women's uh, struggles and activists and organizations. So by weaving these different systems of power and structures into one patriarchal status capitalist uh, violence nexus, the movement advocates also women's autonomous self-organization as a form of self-defense against the killing of life itself. It's also often framed as the killing of life and the protection of life from, from, from male violence and state violence. So slogans like, um, there is no free society without the liberation of women, which is a quote by Abdullah Jalan, are used often across components of the movement and they connect the fight against feminicide to the wider efforts to decolonize Kurdistan and the Middle East and in theory without subjugating the women's struggle to national liberation. So the movement's language and framing uh, refuses these very securitized ways of thinking about uh, protecting women and ending violence against women, which we see becoming more and more common in the world of NGOs, uh, but also it refuses to compartmentalize um, violence against women in the workplace, at home, in war, conflict, family, and so on. Uh, and it also treats the specific targeting of politically engaged women as a distinct phenomenon that requires understanding and particular uh, attention, because there is feminicide that is normalized inside society, but there's also the specific targeting of women who resist patriarchy and the state and so on. So this is a concept that the movement offers to, to others also up for discussion. So. Um, in some, the struggle against feminicide cannot be surrendered to the state, according to the movement, but must be conceived of as a long-term struggle to dismantle patriarchal mentality and domination and to create a different society, to build a different life 
based on the movement's uh, ecological, women's liberationist and democratic uh, paradigm. And this is done in a way that is internationalist and connects with other struggles. So, uh, of course, all of this revolutionary analysis around the question of feminicide is also used to further recruit and mobilize and raise consciousness among women to uh, help be part of the struggle to build um, a democratic, autonomous women's uh, system from below. I think I'll stop here and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Dilla, for your lecture. Um, there are already some questions, actually. So I will ask the first one from um, a friend who is a um, reporter at Sans, uh, Reporter Sans Frontiers. I think it's uh, French and, yeah, it's Reporter Without Borders. And she was asking if you know if in any cases you mentioned um, the women were journalists or you can say something about um, violence against women journalists. Thank you very much for your question and thank you for, for joining. It uh, means a lot to me. Um, I think, uh, th there are, th of course, in the context of the recent wars in the region, uh, in Syria and Iraq, in Turkey and elsewhere, there have been multiple cases of journalists, unfortunately, being killed whilst doing their job, which is basically telling the truth about what is happening. Um, I can think of a couple of examples also in this context, for example, Nujian Erhan or Tuba Akilmas. She was killed in 2017 uh, by the forces of the Kurdistan Democratic Party in Shengal, in Sinjar. Uh, and she had been based in Sinjar for several years and she was basically witnessing the creation of autonomous um, uh, structures by Yazidi women, and unfortunately, she was killed by the fire of these uh, of the of the fighters of the security forces of that party uh, because of political tensions. Uh, then, I, actually, today I think is the anniversary of the death of Denis Furat. Uh, she was a journalist, and she was a she was also a political activist. She was not just a journalist. She was. Um, she was similar to Nojian Erhan, a member of the of the Kurdish Freedom Movement. Uh, she was killed in Mahmur, which is a region where there is a uh, autonomously organized refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan or southern Kurdistan. And um, that place has also been under embargo and heavy fire. And also it was attacked by ISIS in 2014 when ISIS was taking over different parts of Iraq. Uh, she was documenting the fight against uh, ISIS in that region and she was also uh, killed by ISIS whilst doing her job. So. Uh, there are plenty of other examples, and I think in the context of Turkey, for example, there are many women journalists who are in prison. So, um, unfortunately, uh, well, one one very amazing thing that I think uh, we can see in the context of the Kurdish movement is that many of the um, news agencies and magazines and stuff of the movement have an autonomous section on women and also documents violence against women and the struggle of women. So I think this is really important for like uh, what, what journalism and media work and documentation means for the women's struggle is also to follow up on cases of violence. And I think the work of um, Gen TV, for example, or, or uh, some of the autonomous women's um, uh, reporters and, and agencies that exist and that have been flourishing also in the context of Rojava are very interesting in that they are not just documenting cases of violence against women, but they also follow up and see whether justice um, is, is happening. And they also try to do this with a, with a very feminist lens as well. So I think for people who are interested in, in women's journalism in Kurdistan, uh, it, it has a very women's color. It's really a purple color of journalism, I think I would say. And unfortunately, yes, uh, women have also been targeted. And I just gave a few examples, but there are plenty, there are many more that could be talked about. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Dilla. And again, um, for all the invitation to ask the questions in the chat, please right there, even in YouTube or in Zoom. And there was also another question um, from YouTube, and it was asked, um, that sometimes women, um, after they experience sexual violence, are committing suicide. And what would you say? Is it, is it also 
a form of feminicide? Um, that's a very, very, um, that's a very important question, I think. And I think really when in a, in a system, in a society that is patriarchal in which all kinds of violence against women and domination against women is, is so normalized, uh, women are often driven to all kinds of uh, things, including to, to, to self-killing, to, to suicide, or other forms of, uh, of harm to themselves or other people, which um, I would say, yes, um, the fact that we see that many women who experience violence, um, and there's also one thing that needs to be mentioned, I think, is that oftentimes women commit uh, women are murdered, there are feminicides happening, but people cover them up as suicides as well. This is happening a lot in Kurdistan, that families kill their um, daughters, for example, and then burn the body and then say she committed suicide. So there is a general system that, that connects these different uh, things to each other, I think, uh, certainly, because the impact of, uh, of violence on, on one's psychology, on one's bodily um, right uh, on, on one's bodily autonomy cannot be underestimated. So I think, I mean, I don't have a very theoretical answer to this at the moment, but I think um, certainly if women are driven to this um, action because of patriarchal violence, then yes, of course, um, women's suicides uh, are of course also in that sense feminicide, even if they're not committed by someone else. Thank you. Um, in a moment, there are not any more questions, but maybe we will wait one or two minutes more, just if someone is uh, thinking about it. I can see somebody is asking for um, for where to get more information. I think specifically, I mean, if if one wants to find out more about these campaigns and also these um, texts that I mentioned, I would say you can visit um, the Women Defend Rojava website uh, or the Congressar website. Um, also, there is the 100 Reasons campaign website, and um, there are several others that you can find when you press on, on these websites. There are also further links. Um, so the Congress, our Women Defend Rojava, and you can also get in touch, for example, with uh, these groups uh, themselves. Or Repak Women's Relations Office is based in, in, in the Middle East. They are also there to build alliances with different groups in the region. So all of these um, are components of the wider uh, Kurdish women's liberation movement, but they work uh, autonomously in the different contexts. Are there more questions? Um, I think there was uh, another question, but it was not um, exactly for the topic. So actually I would skip it and uh, say the person can have a question later on um, via mail or something, or we can talk about it in a different session. Um, and also I think um, if there are no more questions to this topic especially, um, because it's also a really intensive topic and um, I think maybe there are later more questions or also um, people want to talk about it more, you can um, every time send us an email also and I think there are a lot of um, 
women and a lot of people working um, in this topic. And also, I think um, we see it's really um, important to organize as women together against feminicides and um, to be strong and build up um, a struggle against patriarchy and uh, free society. And this also leads us to the uh, next webinar in September. I want to um, invite all of you also really warmly because it's about, um, it's called Killing the Man. And it's about um, killing, of course, not the man, but the dominant uh, patriarchal man. Um, and um, instead of that, building up a, a democratic man, what does it mean? And this is what we want to talk about in the next seminar. So you all are really warmly invited. And if you want to have an invitation, I will also now send the um, email address of us again in the chat. It's womenwavingfutures at gmail.com. So if you have any questions to this uh, lecture or also to the next, you can write us and also comment on uh, what you think. And so actually I would um, end the session for today if there's nothing more. And, uh, but in the end, uh, I would like to give you the, la the last words you can. Oh, thank you, so. Marlene. Thank you very much for, for moderating. Uh, I think there were just a few other questions in the chat. Uh, I can just quickly address them, uh, mostly relating also to how, um, how, for example, one question is about uh, the idea of women martyrs or the concept of martyrdom applied to non-political deaths. And one question about how men get along with women's fight for freedom. Don't they lose their privileges? And just to take these uh, things together and end on that note, I think um, the struggle against patriarchy, the struggle against violence against women is not a question that should only consider, um, that should only concern women uh, or, or people who are vulnerable to different forms of gendered uh, violence and, or sexualized violence. Uh, I think one of the strengths of the Kurdish movement, and this is where the writings of Abdullah Öcalan are also very key, is to make it not the burden of the victim, but to uh, really make it uh, a way of, or a method to democratize society. So the more we struggle against violence against women, the more we struggle for a world in which women will be free and not just women, but where there's solidarity between different communities, where there are different, more direct democratic ways of, of living uh, and where our, relationships to each other and to different forms of life are based on an ecological mentality. I think the more we struggle towards that, we will also approach new questions for, for freedom as well. So I think, um, yes, of course, uh, there's a lot of problems. There are so many um, different situations in which the organized women encounter resistance from, from men inside their communities or where they themselves have to uh, overcome internalized sexism and misogyny and all kinds of other um, forms of violence and exclusion happening against uh, against people because of these patriarchal uh, ideologies and mentalities. So in that sense, I think it's important to connect these different struggles to each other to make sure that we don't understand the struggle against feminicide as being disconnected from also the fight against uh, fascism, for example, or against militarism and so on. So of course, this will also mean having difficult conversations with people, for example, um, men in our families or in our communities and so on. But the most important thing is to trust one's own autonomy and to build new concepts for it for self uh, defense and to not surrender this struggle uh, for freedom to states and other systems of, of power. I think this is one of the most important things uh, to take away from this. And this also means to come to the question of um, civilian uh, women versus political women who are targeted. I think um, connecting the fight against uh, for the so-called honor killings to uh, the struggle against fascism on a global scale. I think this is a very profound uh, revolutionary thing to do. And I think this is one of the things that other struggles also can learn from each other, how to make sure we do not um, pretend that violence against women in our communities is uh, not happening, for example, or 
uh, to divorce these different things from each other. So sorry, this was a bit more rambly than I was hoping, but I think um, hopefully people who have participated uh, will be able to engage with these concepts of the movement and also, uh, of course, that the Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement can also, as it has in the past and is continuing to do so, learn from other struggles as well and towards building common shared platforms for common struggle. So thank you very much all for coming and for listening.